dear chapter members uh, and all of the participants uh, i know it has been a long since our last webinar and i welcome you all 100 plus participants to take out time for this webinar on a weekday i really appreciate that uh, I especially welcome new members who joined us recently in the last quarter and didn't get a chance to meet and network with other chapter members. Please feel free to network on our WhatsApp knowledge group and LinkedIn group as well. Uh, we understand uh, this challenging times, which no one anticipated in their wildest imagination, is here to test our resilience and greet. Uh, recent times has definitely seen increased email phishing, malware, and social engineering attacks with the remote work. Uh, businesses are shifting operational procedures to protect their people and resources, which are now working remote from a network or environment they don't trust. Uh, definitely, uh, these are interesting times. Uh, so today's webinar is also related on the age of COVID-19. So we will be talking about how can we do more with less how small teams use intelligence to prioritize large number of vulnerabilities in this COVID-19 era. Uh, this webinar is, is sponsored by Cyricon, the industry's most accurate predictive scorer of weaponized exploits, and we thank them uh, for this. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce you to today's webinar speakers. So the gentleman who you can see in the video as well, uh, he is Paul Shakarian. Uh, he is PhD and the CEO and co-founder of Cyber Reconnaissance, which is abbreviated as Cyricon. It took me a while to figure out, like, hey, what, what Cyricon stands for. So uh, he, this, he specializes in combining artificial intelligence with information mined from deep dark web, uh, malicious hacker communities to avoid cyber attacks. He's also in, uh, written numerous articles in scientific journals and has authored several books related to cybersecurity. Uh, we also have Geoff Stoker. Uh, he is a PhD and assistant professor in the University of North Carolina. He is a former chief information security officer of the 82nd Airborne. Geoff Stoker served 24 and a half years in the US Army. And since July 2016, he has worked with Cyricon in various capacities, including as an interface between customers and developers. We are also joined by James Janusek. James is an IT professional with 20 years of industry experience who also owns an MSP and consulting firm specializing in small to mid-sized business technology. He primarily held IT director roles before forming his own company, Sunbite Solutions. So uh, I hope you enjoy this diverse background of the speakers uh, and like these are all army veterans and they definitely understand the risk uh, in the real life and in the cyber landscape. Over to you, Paulo. Thank you very much. So um, first off, again, I appreciate you all taking time out of your evening or morning for those of you uh, joining outside of India. To Today, we're going to talk about vulnerability management, in particular, how to deal with the enormous amount of vulnerabilities that organizations have, especially now in the era of COVID-19, we're seeing a lot of security teams are operating under constrained resources. So the first bit, probably not going to come as a surprise to too many of you, is that the number of software vulnerabilities that have been disclosed since 2017 has been rapidly increasing. Uh, already this year, we're seeing somewhere between a 15 to 20 percent increase in vulnerability disclosures over last year. And due to the high volume of disclosures, we're seeing that 60% of enterprises are now admitting to being breached due to known but unpatched vulnerabilities. And about 80% of breaches and audit failures um, could have been resolved with the patch. And again, here's just showing the trend for this year. We're seeing, you know, at the orange line, 2020 vulnerability disclosures are pulling more and more away uh, from where they were at last year. Now, I want to show you something really quick. I'm going to switch to um, the NVD database just to give you an idea. You know, if you're not already using this, this is a very uh, handy resource to have. Um, looking at the dashboard gives you an idea of 
the rate of disclosures. We see already there's been 210 in the past week. Um, also, you get to see how these are divided up amongst the different rankings by the CBSS score. And you see it's roughly around 60% are critical and high. Um, and this is pretty normal. So going to get into a thing that we call ignored threats. Now, an ignored threat occurs when you have a software vul vulnerability that's being used by hackers, but for some reason you didn't decide to patch that ahead of time. Perhaps the most famous case of this would be with the Equifax breach. But more recently, we've seen um, about two weeks ago, the Russian hacking group Cozy Bear or APT29 stole COVID-19 vaccine research from the US and the UK, and this was all over the news. Turns out they're using about four vulnerabilities. They're all 2019 vulnerabilities. And when you look at this summary here, you see in the first scene and last scene, that's date ranges of when threat intelligence was gathered on these vulnerabilities uh, by this particular platform. And you see right away that there's been information collected on those vulnerabilities since the time of disclosure. Um, the vulnerabilities used in, uh, in these incidents were not only known, but they were known to have active threats posed against them. And this is the kind of thing that today we're going to talk about how to get ahead of these threats, how to start your work on your patch management or your system upgrades in a way that focuses first on the threat. Now we'll pause for a moment and just ask a question to the audience. What percentage of vulnerabilities, 2020 vulnerabilities that start with a CVE 2020, do you think have been exploited so far this year? So take a moment. Uh, you should be getting a poll question in a, in a second there. And uh, Rebecca, do we have uh, results of that? Yes, it looks like the, the primary answer right now is B. So everyone is selecting 20%. OK. So actually, uh, according to Fortinet, a report they released about a week ago, it's 1% for 2020 volumes. Um, most of the vulnerabilities that have been exploited this year have actually been uh, 2019 and 2018 vulnerabilities. And, you know, we put this uh, little survey out, uh, not only, you know, to surprise you, because I think a couple of years ago, I probably would have been surprised at this too. But in, you know, uh, the work we've done at the company and prior to that, um, you know, a letter, uh, the research, the scientific research we did in vulnerability management. It's been about when you look at, you know, considering prior years as well, you're looking at about 3% of vulnerabilities have been exploited. And I have led studies that have shown this. I've seen studies out of places like the University of Maryland um, and uh, MIT Lincoln Labs. And we always see the numbers usually hover, depending on how they count it, usually hover between somewhere from 1% to 3%, depending on, on the study. Now, that is very low. Now, remember what I just showed you a minute ago here. When you look at the NIST scoring system, you're seeing that the highs and criticals are about 60%. And so there's a big difference there there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained by focusing on what the bad guys are actually going, going to hit. Now, along those lines, I'm going to pause and turn it over to James, who's going to give us a case study about his experiences with looking at more of a threat-focused approach to vulnerability management. James? Hi, everyone. This is James Janusek from Sunbite Solutions. And the case I'm gonna discuss involves um, 
my first interaction with kind of security threats that we really didn't think were going to be there. So as, as an IT provider for small and mid-sized businesses, I'm often tasked with validating or configuring security for client environments. This situation where both myself and my client did not really think there were any kind of critical issues that needed to be addressed. This, this was a very simple, small environment at a law firm with about 10 PCs, printers, and a router. And we had automated patching in place of all these devices through MSP tools provided by my company, Sunbite Solutions. All the eligible devices had been patched with the most recent updates available. We decided to do a vulnerability scan when a client of the firm wanted kind of tangible assurance that the, their case data was safe. We somewhat reluctantly agreed to do this more as a courtesy than thinking we were really going to find anything. The scan revealed some interesting items for us. We saw some vulnerabilities that were to be expected as we had configured certain ports and services to be open for needed functionality. What we didn't expect was a list of about 19 critical CVEs on a router that had just recently been patched to the latest firmware. We didn't know how dangerous these vulnerabilities were, but clearly the manufacturer wasn't patching them. The vulnerabilities were all related to uh, the Ripple 20 exploit. This was when we decided to engage Cyrixon. To our surprise, after running the vulnerabilities through Cyrixon's priority tool, Four of them were given a very high Psi rating score. This is a figure that Cyrocon produces to illustrate kind of the current risk of any given vulnerability. These were really vulnerabilities that could be exploited at any given moment. Um, we contacted the router manufacturer, but we could not really ascertain whether they intended to patch the router in the near future or what their plan was. And in this case, it was kind of a more consumer focus rather um, and support on this type of thing wasn't very well remediated. Um, based on this information and the sensitivity, sensitivity of the data that this client had, the decision was made to inform them they needed to replace the router with a product that was up to the latest security. In this case, that simply meant upgrading to a commercial security appliance from a well-known vendor that stays current with patching. And this situation definitely opened my eyes to the reality of the dangers out there. Um, I work mainly in the small business space, so I somewhat felt that the majority of my clients were immune to these type of threats, as long as you know we kept current on patching. This situation kind of revealed that it's not always the case, and the actual hardware vendors are not always staying current with the latest vulnerabilities. Even at the small business level, employing some method of evaluating vulnerabilities has now become standard practice for Sunbite. And yeah, like I said, this case definitely opened my eyes to just how lax some of the hardware vendors are in getting patches and immediately to these exploits that can be um, utilized very easily. So thank you. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Paolo. So uh, thank you, James. Um, you know, the case study that that James described, you know, this is really showing that when you look at the vulnerabilities and you start associating them with threats, it paints a different picture of what's important as opposed to just saying, well, hey, we patched everything we could, everything's as up to date as possible. Uh, going that extra step and seeing that not only were there vulnerabilities on that router, but there were uh, there was known threats against them. James was taking steps to avoid things that happened with, you know, let's say the University of Utah the other week that paid a four hundred fifty seven thousand dollar ransom um, to NetWalk a ransomware gang, even though they were using vulnerabilities in that attack that were again already known and that they were known to have existing threats to. Now, this problem spans a wide variety of, of uh, security teams, spanning from folks like James who support the lower tier of the market all the way up to uh, the high end. And now to share with us some of the lessons learned from 
some of the world's top vulnerability management teams, we have Jeff Stoker. Hello, everyone. So what James shared is really important, and it, it brings us to what we are going to call modern vulnerability management, which reflects an idealized arrangement of uh, the teams and functions that we have based on our compilation of many experiences and conversations with clients. Next slide, please. So quickly orient you to this idealized organization. The circle on the left is vulnerability scanning, uh, responsible for IDing vulns, very familiar to people. The bottom center circle is a threat intelligence cell. They are responsible for IDing threats. The top center circle is vulnerability prioritization or vuln management, which assesses the likelihood of threat. And the circle on the right is IT. They assess likelihood of impact and conduct patching operations. Next slide. So the vuln scanning, this is generally pretty well understood. Uh, still a few problems with things like false positives, but scanning is getting better all the time. And I think this is the part of the process that everyone currently has the best handle on. Next slide. Threat intelligence is perhaps next best understood as folks have been analyzing threats for as long as people have been on the planet. And there are some challenges about how exactly you analyze threat intel uh, and incorporate it into vuln management, but there are lots of mature threat teams out there doing really good work. Next slide. So the IT function, uh, this is where it gets a little bit organizational dependent. We have seen different companies use uh, different ideas when assessing the likelihood of impact. Sometimes this is done within the IT team. Uh, sometimes there's a uh, strong leader or uh, sort of an emphasis on the chief information security officer handling this. Uh, and sometimes we see uh, something else. Um, in just a bit, Paul's gonna talk about the bubble I have not talked about, vulnerability prioritization. But first, let's do another poll. So this poll is asking, what is the average cost per patch for an enterprise? What do you think? Okay, so that's been about 10 seconds. Um, Rebecca, can you see the results? Yes, it does look like the, the group is, is saying B for 19,000. Okay, go ahead. Let's look at the answer. So fantastic, actually. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, I went a little low on this when I when I was first looking at it, but uh, Tech Republic reports that in fact, uh, B nineteen thousand uh, is the answer. Uh, so good on you all who who got it right and drove the group to that answer. Paulo, thank you, Jeff. So we talked a bit about you know the the problem of uh, dealing with many vulnerabilities and also james provided this uh you know summary or the story of how in in the case of that client of his that it made a difference in determining what to do while jeff summarized sort of how we're seeing vuln management teams work to do this stuff at the high level now let's get into sort of the you know how it's done so how do you identify threats associated with the vulnerability? Well, let's start by first looking at CVSS scoring. Now, CVSS scoring is perhaps the most common way to assess vulnerabilities. And as we saw uh, when I brought up the NIST webpage, you see the, you know, the different tiers of high, critical, medium, and so on. And of course, the advantage of this, it's free. Uh, every major vulnerability scanner includes this ranking as part of the output. Uh, it's simple to understand. And because it's been around so long and it has uh, the U.S. National Institute of Standards sort of seal of approval on it, 
uh, it's widely accepted and many use it for compliance or have it embedded in their policies. Now the disadvantage is it's not based on threat. Um, yeah, and I'll show you some information on why that is in a moment. Uh, about 60% of the vulnerabilities are rated high and critical as you saw in the breakdown and I'll just flip back to that. So remember that is uh, much different from you know, about 3% of vulnerabilities that get exploited. Now here's the kicker, is that peer-reviewed studies have shown that CVSS score is not predictive. Even if I take the CVSS score and I somehow put it in a machine learning algorithm by itself, it will not do a good job predicting which vulnerabilities will be exploited. In fact, it'll do about the same as random guess. Now, first I'll bring up the uh, NIST CVSS calculator here in my browser. Now, this is a tool that's online. A lot of people don't know about this, but you can actually go and you can calculate the NIST CVSS score on your own. So for example, if you uh, read about a vulnerability where there's no CVE number yet, and you wanna see, well, what would NIST say? You can go and calculate that. And so there's uh, all the different things that go into calculating the score. But here's the thing is that this is not based on the intelligence. Um, you can say that, well, maybe intelligence influences how, you know, I select these things here. But NIST is not using intelligence to drive the scores. They're not using it themselves to do this. And that's why when we go back to peer-reviewed studies, it's been shown not to be predictive. Now, I'm not saying, you know, let's just totally throw it out and it's worthless. It has its place. It's, you know, like I said, it's become part of compliance and policy. But one shouldn't think of it as a way uh, to predict a threat. And you can go back and you can look at things like Heartbleed, for example. That was one of the most widely known or widely used vulnerabilities, and it was assessed with a CVSS score of about five out of 10. And it's uh, not uncommon. And what you see here is this is, uh, this is a uh, result from a peer reviewed study showing a comparison between a machine learning approach to predicting which vulnerabilities will be exploited and comparing that to CVSS. Now, if you're not familiar with machine learning, reading uh, curves like this, you want to see uh, you want to see the uh, lines go up and to the right. So when you see a lines hugging the bottom there, which is what we're looking at for a CVSS score, uh, that is is not a very uh, good performance. And in particular, when you look at precision, which is the fraction of predicted vulnerabilities that were actually exploited, CVSS is doing somewhere in the neighborhood of 3%, which is what you would get for random guess. And it doesn't make a difference, really, the version of CVSS, the results, these results have held up. And a big hint as to why this is the case is you look at how many vulnerabilities are getting that very high level of CVSS score. And that kind of tells you a lot right there. It's very different from the reality of what hackers actually use. So uh, it's, you know, even though uh, CVSS scoring, you know, we, there, we have all this data on um, why it's not predictive and all that. The funny thing is, uh, in our company, when we go and talk to vol management teams, we never have to convince anyone that CVSS scoring is not the best way to prioritize your vulnerabilities. Uh, most most uh, high-end teams, they're already quite aware of that, and they're doing other things. And so getting back into what Jeff was showing, especially the bubbles on vulnerability prioritization and threat intelligence, you know, one thing they look at is exploit availability. And this is really the start of a threat-focused approach. Um, and what you're doing is you're looking to see, is there an exploit available? Is this being exploited? Now, the disadvantages to this approach is you're kind of stuck with only which 
exploits are out there now. Um, this does not provide any kind of rank ordering over the threats um, because it's sort of binary, it's either a yes or a no. And uh, another thing that's bad about this approach is, uh, I'll give you an example, when um, Spectre and Meltdown, the two big Intel vulnerabilities were disclosed, I think about two years ago, uh, we had a lot of vulnerability management teams come to us and say, hey, what are the bad guys saying about this? My boss is reading this in the newspaper and he wants to know, is this going to affect us? And the interesting thing was that Spectre and Meltdown made a lot of media based on the vulnerability and there was no exploit at the time. Now, POC exploits and exploits in the wild did appear over time. And that was actually really exciting to watch. We saw with our system how it changed the uh, likelihood of exploitation over time as different threat intelligence came in. But at the very beginning, there really wasn't a lot right when those media reports came out. If you rely on an approach dealing with exploit availability, you're not going to see anything be predicted when something hits the media like that. And then I think probably the biggest disadvantage we've seen is maintenance of uh, data sources for exploit availability uh, can become very difficult. Um, this ends up becoming a big project in and of itself. And when you have a vuln management team that has to manage your vuln scanner software, uh, you know, be tuning that for false positives, um, you know, presenting reports to the IT guys so they can patch accordingly, this becomes, this is a big load of work that could take a lot of time. Now, um, one thing I want to talk about in terms of exploit availability is there's a little bit of a confluence here we've seen with a lot of people. There's exploits in the wild, um, and, you know, those are things that are actually used in an attack. Uh, what you see a lot of um, uh, sources that provide exploits in the wild, information about those, Oftentimes, you, you get that from vendors of your, your SIM or firewall or endpoint protection system because they're tracking which vulnerabilities are being exploited. Now, when you look at um, the vendors of vulnerability scanners like Rapid7, they're actually focused on recently weaponized exploits. And so, of course, Rapid7, if you're not familiar with Metasploit, this is something you should be tracking for your vulnerability management program. A Metasploit module is essentially a uh, uh, exploit for a vulnerability that's been weaponized to a very high degree. It's very easy to launch an attack with Metasploit. It's uh, sort of plug and play, so the software is very modular. So by the time there's a Metasploit module, Usually there's already been an exploit in the wild for this vulnerability. And if there hasn't, it probably will come up soon because these things are very easy to exploit. Now, if you're using Metasploit modules as your main way to rank order threat, it's certainly better than just using CVSS. But the problem is, is you're seeing things in the very later stages of exploitation. Uh, usually what we see is there's a lot of custom uh, exploits that come out before the Metasploit module that are used in attacks. And Metasploit module, by the time it gets to there, now it's sort of the gates are wide open. You're seeing script kiddies do stuff um, because Metasploit module really lowers the bar where someone can use it to launch an attack. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have what's an exploit DB. And you see here, um, I did a search on, uh, you know, one of the vulnerabilities used in Patcha, and we have a Metasploit module uh, for it. What's nice about Exploit DB is it also shows um, the type. So for the same vulnerability, this vulnerability could be leveraged for both a denial of service and a remote code execution, as you see here. Um, so it tells you what the different vulnerabilities uh, can be used for. Um, exploit DB, though, is primarily dealing with what you'd call a proof of concept exploit. And proof of concept exploits are much more widely produced, but not always weaponized. 
Um, depending whose numbers you read, you'll see maybe it's about 20% uh, of vulnerabilities there will be a proof of concept for. Um, most of those proof of concepts never end up getting used in an attack. There's other concerns besides just showing that the vulnerability can be exploited. So a lot of times proof of concept code, you see someone wrote a Python script and they did just enough where it can be exploited. Um, sometimes it's a security professional doing it and they're just, you know, they saw a recent vulnerability in the news and they're trying to get uh, some attention for doing that. Um, you know, but it doesn't mean it'll be used in an attack. Uh, when hackers consider what vulnerabilities to use to launch an attack, they have other things to consider. Can I scale the attack? Um, can I easily use this exploit with the malware payload that I am also wanting to use? Because I'm looking more just to break into a computer system. I have some objective I want to accomplish. So does the exploit that there's code for, does it work with uh, the other software I have to accomplish my objective. We've seen other things too, uh, studies that have shown that about half of the vulnerabilities that are exploited in the wild, there's no proof of concept code available beforehand. And so that's the other danger about relying on proof of concept code. So I think it's highly useful. Um, you know, in our intelligence analysis and our product, we consider proof of concept code as well, but I don't think by itself it should be used as a sole thing to rank vulnerabilities. So this leads us to third piece. So, you know, we looked at CVSS score, which is sort of better than doing nothing. We looked at exploit availability, which is significant improvement, but has, you know, its drawbacks. Intelligence assessment, this is what you see where your uh, vuln management team is either working with the threat intel people to get information about vulnerabilities or they're doing their own research even in the threat intel and this is really the best way to get ahead of a threat because if you're reading the intelligence uh, you're going to be on top of things without having to wait for an exploit or even a poc and even if there is a poc now you could start piecing together the pieces you have you know, maybe there's a hacker who's um, asking, hey, does anyone have a weaponized version of this PLC that I can use in an attack um, and stuff like that? And now you can start to make better assessments. Now, the problem with this, though, is it entails a lot of manual effort. And what we have seen, uh, most large enterprises, what they do is their intelligence assessment is actually covering a very small fraction of vulnerabilities. And in most places, it looks something like the Intel guys, if they see vulnerabilities in the Intel, they will push that to uh, the vuln management team. But the Intel guys, they're focused more on, you know, kind of what uh, they're mostly interested in, and they're not designing their intelligence analysis to focus on vulnerabilities. And we have seen even companies that um, ha where the vuln management team has a good relationship with the threat intel team, they will still miss intelligence uh, because the threat intel team, quite frankly, has other priorities. Uh, in many places, the threat intel team, they're also managing the IOCs. They are doing malware reverse engineering. Uh, they are doing uh, brand protection, doing things like looking in the dark web if you know, someone's stealing uh, your credentials or IP. So the threat intel team has a lot of other tasks and they're certainly not going to be able to do intelligence analysis on say the 20,000 vulnerabilities from your most recent scan. And that leads to the third piece is, um, you know, doing manual analysis. Uh, while I think that's important and there should be certain vulnerabilities that you decide to do that for, you can't do manual analysis on all your vulnerabilities. And this is where we see um, sort of holes in people's game plan. Now I'll give you a highlight of how some of this comes together. So this is a 2018 uh, vulnerability. Uh, we were uh, working with a major bank um, and they had this vulnerability open. It had a low NIST CVSS score, but 
when we showed them the intelligence that was associated with it, active Russian hacker conversation, available exploits. Um, notice here the intelligence on the Russian forum talks about a demonstration at the University of Havana in Cuba. And this particular customer had this vulnerability open as recently as May. They were pretty much not paying attention because older vuln, low NIST score, you know, why should I care? Um, and you kind of see it's the same attitude that that router manufacturer had that James was talking about. And this happens all the time. When you start bringing intelligence in, now you start seeing, you know, where the, the holes are. And getting back to my stat from earlier on, you know, 60% of organizations say they're getting pat, uh, breached due to known but unpatched vulnerabilities. Uh, this is the kind of vulnerability that leads to that. So I'll quickly show you a glance of our platform. Uh, hold on one. Okay, so I'm sharing again. So what you see here is you see a list of vulnerabilities. I uploaded a list of vulnerabilities um, that were used in some recent attacks just to provide a, a quick demo. And when you click on the vulnerability, you see, you know, here is the associated threat intelligence. And we see, you know, from threat intelligence sources, there's some, some Twitter here. Here is information on an active exploit that was published by Broadcom. Uh, maybe going back a little further, uh, we can see here is information on a pen test framework module. Um, and here is a uh, open source report about Iranian groups who were weaponizing the vulnerability. So. Uh, it's really important to be able to pull, you know, different source of threat intelligence on a vulnerability together. And, you know, that's what you're seeing here in, in this platform. Okay, so pause again. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what percentages of breaches or audit failures could have been avoided with a patch? So we'll hold on for a moment, let folks answer that. All right, uh, Rebecca, do we have survey results? Um, it looks like the group is going with C, 50%. So again, this one is actually a little bit higher at 80%, uh, according to survey results from Heimdall. Uh, this was a 2019 study. So, OK. I will now turn it over to Jeff Stoker. Uh, we talked again about, you know, the problem. We talked about how organizations have arrayed their team, how to augment your vulnerability scanning information with uh, things like exploit availability and intelligence. And Jeff is going to talk about how that gets tied together because now you need to quantify the vulnerability so you can do priorities of work in terms of patching and upgrading. Jeff? Thanks, Paulo. So yeah, we're into the last part of the webinar, quantifying threats. We have vulnerability management teams, uh, you know, they're working to quantify threat and they've come up with different methods. But in the aggregate, we've seen three general approaches used to assess the likelihood of exploitation. And we're going to share those with you now. Uh, next slide. So approach one, involves assigning uh, some kind of a threat level to existing vulns. So for example, uh, vulns could be classified at the highest level if there is evidence that the vuln has already been successfully exploited in the wild. Uh, a level two 
might be related to an exploit being incorporated into a pen testing framework. Uh, the existence of a proof of concept exploit could be a level three vuln. And then level four would be any kind of threat intelligence indicator. And hopefully this, this is following very easily, making sense based on uh, Paulo's recent uh, discussion. So the primary plus to this approach is very simple. Uh, however, it really doesn't give us sufficient granularity and uh, it struggles to appropriately account for some situations like when uh, vulnerabilities for which there is solid threat intel that there is an impending exploitation, uh, but that it has not yet occurred, right? Like how does that get captured? Um, approach two, next slide, sir. Uh, next, the next approach is to use some sort of a weighting mechanism uh, where the view is gonna be a bit more granular since we're gonna actually score the vulnerabilities. And uh, in this example, an exploit in the wild might be valued at 100 points, which could be added to a Voln's threat score. Uh, if it's included in a pen test module, maybe it's worth a little less, so something like 90 points. Each available proof of concept, you might add 50 points to the score. And uh, each piece of threat intelligence you find that specifically mentions the Voln, you might add 10 points. Uh, now, again, this is, I think, a pretty relatively straightforward to implement technique. Uh, however, it, it has a little bit of an insidious uh, downside, and that's that it appears quantitative. It appears like, hey, we're doing some real work here. Um, but at the end of the day, the points are a bit arbitrary. Uh, and as well, they're not threat related. There's, you know, there's kind of no threat intel uh, that backs it. This is all a reaction. To, to what has happened to the vulnerability. So next slide, the third approach, and this of course is the preferred approach, is to use some kind of a predictive uh, model. And so uh, using machine learning is, you know, the, the, the real kind of emergence of AI in recent years has helped this greatly. And this approach involves several steps. So first off, uh, you gotta go look at older vulns uh, about which we know a great deal and you take all the information that's been accumulated on older vulns uh, related to intelligence, exploits, et cetera. You clean it, you normalize it, and you put it into a database. Once you've done all that work and you have a, a solid corpus of, of data, uh, you use what's called a training algorithm. And given that you know which of the old vulns were actually exploited, you can create a machine learning model that takes the database information as input and learns to correctly indicate uh, that a vuln will be exploited if it has you know, certain factors. Uh, the, the final step is that you now have a, a model that can be used on new input data and you can use it to predict if new vulns are likely to be exploited. Now, the, the plus side of this is that it's likely to be, I mean, it's gonna be the most accurate method since it's data driven uh, especially by threat intelligence. Uh, of course, the downside is is the opposite of what was good about the previous two methods, right? It's it's tough to implement. It's going to require uh, pers highly skilled personnel with AI expertise. It's going to require comprehensive data collection, uh, both in the past and ongoing, uh, a streamlined process that has you know that's not dependent on manual intervention, and and on and on and on. So. Uh, to provide a bit of a flavor for what this entails, uh, let's walk through some data that we've put in a spreadsheet that uh, we've done this just for ease of viewing during this webinar. So to, to kind of make this explicit, you can sort of just imagine this might be, uh, you know, a table in your database or kind of just representative. Uh, you look at the first four columns, columns A through D, you see that this is standard vulnerability information provided publicly at the NVD, right? We got the CVID number. Um, then we've got something called CWE ID, which is uh, how it's categorized uh, uh, in how it's used. We have the two versions of the CVSS scoring, uh, version two and version three. Uh, columns E, F, and G, they show some of the key indicators related to the presence of a working exploit. And hopefully by now, if this is new to you, you know, you've heard us talk about this maybe three times, you know, is the proof of concept available? Is there a pen test module? Uh, 
uh, is there an exploit in the wild? And then these are these are good indicators that can be incorporated into uh, your machine learning model. Columns H through L, which are almost all the rest of them, uh, these are just a sampling or an example of the kinds of threat intel that you uh, would want to incorporate. And the examples we've provided here, we've got the first the, the first date that threat intel was found. We've got the latest date that threat intel was found. And in this example, we just have, you know, arbitrarily we've picked three intelligence reports that specifically mention the Vuln. Uh, keep in mind, this is really just an example of the data that you would use. Uh, there are many more indicators like hacker social structure, reputation language, et cetera, that you would want to incorporate into producing an output. And then in this particular case, column M on the far right-hand side, uh, it shows that the model produces a single score. And this single score is a, is a risk measurement that reflects real-world threat. Uh, and it it's, can be done per Voln, which is really what you need if you're going to prioritize Volns uh, based on which ones have the, the greatest likelihood to cause damage to your organization. Uh, Paula, do you want to add anything to what I've said? Um, yeah, the only thing I, I'd like to add is that, you know, some organizations we work with, they may have certain policies around indicators. So they might say, well, if there is, say, a pen test framework module available, um, we would prioritize those above other things. But the order in which we do it would be you know, by the risk assessment score. Then for everything else where there's say not a pen test module available, then we're going to go through those according to the risk score. Um, and there's, we've seen a lot of different approaches to this, but I think the key in all of it is, you know, one is have a policy and two, uh, when you have a given category of vulnerabilities that you've identified by the policy, what is the order in which you make those patching or upgrading decisions? Um, and you know this kind of analysis you see here is designed to help with that. So on that note, um, I think that concludes the uh, formal part of the presentation. We'll now open it up to any questions. Thank you, Paulo, uh, for, and James and Jeff for a great session on vulnerability management. Uh, as you mentioned, like CV prioritization is an issue, and a large number of them are ranked critical and high. And that's where threat intel comes handy. So uh, now we'll move to our Q&A section. Uh, so let me get the first question for you. So one of the participants has a question, why can't I just patch everything that is an exploit DV? Uh, wouldn't that solve the problem? So, um, ex like I said, exploit DB is is very useful, um, but there's really two issues with that. Is one about half of the vulnerabilities that get exploited in the wild, uh, there is no proof of concept ahead of time, so you're going to be missing those by being overly focused on exploit DB. And I think the other aspect of it is that. Um, exploit DB, you're looking at a larger fraction of vulnerabilities that will have something in exploit DB as opposed to what actually ends up being exploited. Now, it's way better than using CVSS score, in my opinion, but it's, I think, not a 100% um, answer, and you're still going to be at high risk of breach with that approach. So thanks. Uh, so we have got a few more questions here. One is what to do when attacker uses a combination of low or medium priority vulnerabilities to compromise the system. So we we are talking about critical and high. So the participant wants to know what to do when someone uses a low or medium priority vulnerabilities to compromise the system. So, um, you know, so getting back, I'll just flip back to the uh, couple slides back here. Hold on when we gave this threat intelligence example. This here, this was a low uh, 
low priority vulnerability by the NIST CVSS scale. And so the key here was in order to identify this as being having a threat associated with it and to be ahead of hackers like uh, what you described in the question, um, having the intelligence to indicate that allows you to overcome this. And, um, and so when we in our product uh, rank vulnerabilities with our machine learning algorithm, we see that the distribution of what has a high score is independent of the CVSS score. There's plenty of vulnerabilities that have a low CVSS score like this one that have a high level of threat. Um, it's not that you, know, you should flip your lows and highs or anything like that. It's just not related to where the threat is. And so this is really why um, you know, having a threat-focused approach is important because if you're just patching your highs and criticals, you're going to miss a lot of threats like this one. Sure, that that was a well uh, point. I think uh, uh, that additional metrics definitely help what NVIDIA provides by default. So uh, we have like many other questions coming in. Uh, um, let me pick another one for you. Uh, it may not be uh, related to exactly this, but the our question is: What, according to you, is the best scanner to scan infrastructure for vulnerabilities, agent-based or non-agent? So, I, I mean, we work with a lot of different vendors of vulnerability scanners and a lot of teams. Um, in our opinion, that there's kind of, uh, you know, two things about the vulnerability scanner is, A, um, have you tuned it properly? Um, if you use any vulnerability scanner out of the box without doing some tuning, you're going to get a lot of false positives, and that's going to exasperate your prioritization problems. Um, now, tuning is not going to eliminate your prioritization problems. You're still going to get a lot of vulns, especially you know, due to the disclosure rate, but you really need to make sure it's tuned. So if, if you, know, you were to say one scanner is better than the other, um, if you had strong feelings about that, I could almost guarantee you I could find you a user of the one that is inferior, who's getting better results than the other guy because he's tuned it better. I'd say the second piece about the vulnerability scanner is um, the coverage of their vulnerability tests. So when you talk to a vendor of a vulnerability scanner, ask them questions about how quickly when a CVE, after a CVE is out, do they have that vulnerability test ready? And how does that vary by software type? Um, it can be very different from vendor to vendor based on what they focus on. Some vendors are very focused on traditional IT. Some are focused more on IoT. Some are focused more on web-based applications. And you may even want to use multiple scanners. And then I think the third piece of it is what kind of management tools uh, are available. You know, here at Syracon, we provide uh, the intelligence and many of our customers, they're using homegrown tools or they're using tools from another vendor to manage the vulnerability data. Uh, we work with clients that get literally hundreds of thousands of vulnerabilities and, you know, they need serious data management to handle that. Um, if you're operating at that scale, you need to consider the data management piece and maybe your Vuln scanner vendor can offer that, or maybe you need to uh, grow that on your own. Hey, so, Paulo, can I add something to that? Sure, please sure. go ahead. Yep, very briefly. So, of course, I agree with everything Paulo said. I just want to expand a little bit and say that sometimes uh, you should just be aware that scanning has evolved quite a bit. You know, it's not so much like, hey, let me get the best scanner and run it. But what are you scanning for? You know, are you scanning for internal? Are you scanning from external? Are you are you working in a company that creates software and you need to be scanning the libraries that you're using, the open source libraries as part of uh, the products you're building? Um, so I just wanted to expand a little bit. You know, lots of different kinds of scanners out there that do lots of kind of specialized jobs that become more important the more mature your scanning process gets. Sure. Uh, I think I have a related question there. 
do you offer integrated licenses which would allow us to download your data feed to use in our own reporting slash analytics engine? Yes, at Cyrocon, we provide our solution both in a web-based user interface as well as through an API. And we've got a very extensive uh, software development toolkit that if you want to take our intelligence into whatever custom um, solution you've designed, we fully support that. And we have many existing customers who use that that way. Sure. Uh, other question we have is, what are your recommendations on using OS risk assessment methodology for quantifying threats? Um, the, you know, the OWASP is, is useful with the top 10. Um, I think it's, uh, it's more of like, you know, these are the things that are kind of on fire if you have these issues um, and, you know, you should address that right away. Um, I think also the OWASP ranking of um, common weaknesses, again, that's useful. But when you look at uh, the vulnerabilities that have those weaknesses uh, on a given scan, you'll see that for each of those categories, there will be a lot. And I think that using the weaknesses alone is not, um, you know, that's not going to be complete. We've seen, you know, OWASP is going to have you end up focusing more on things like SQLI and cross-site scripting. And while, of course, many of those vulnerabilities are being actively exploited, you don't want to miss, say, you know, the next SIGRED or WannaCry um, because you're overly focused on cross-site scripting. Sure, thanks for that. Uh, we have one more question. In today's landscape of zero-day exploits and the speed and agility at which malware developers operate, the window of opportunity is way too less. Practically, organizations have challenges to trigger the remediation process. How can this gap can be solved? I think that's a great question. Uh, I think when you look at a zero-day exploit for a vulnerability, um, you, when you look at the lag time between you know, initial disclosure to that uh, exploit uh, for known vulnerabilities, there there often is a lag time. I'd say, you know, probably it's around uh, 70 or 80 percent of the time. Uh, in those cases, you can get ahead of that zero day exploit through the use of intelligence like what we've shown here. Now, when you have a vulnerability where, you know, there's a lot of cases uh, where the CVE number comes out at the same time as it's been announced, it's exploited in the wild. Um, there's sort of two things about that that you can do is one is general intelligence about, um, you know, the software being discussed, the software in question being discussed, are hackers um, passing around exploits for something where there's no CVE number yet, um, you know, so that's something to consider. Uh, and then additionally is making sure you have excellent sources uh, that track exploits in the wild. Uh, so when when you do have the case where there's the vendor waits until there's an exploit before registering the CVE number, you can see right away that that CVE is a very high priority because you already know there's an exploit. Sure. Uh, there is one more question as well. Can we predict vulnerability with deep neural network? Um, so, so uh, deep neural networks, uh, they have been used for this problem. Uh, I actually um, personally worked a little bit with some researchers at a University of Southern California who've adopted that. Um, what we found in our product is we use uh, neural network models as a, um, as a more primitive operation because what you what we found is that the neural network models are good at operating on text, but then when you have a lot of heterogeneous data sources, um, the neural network model becomes uh, more um, difficult to uh, not overfit the data. Um, the big problem with neural models is uh, if they are not properly maintained, they will overfit the data and lose their predictive power. This particularly happens when you have heterogeneous data. Um, 
which is why why we use a mix of approaches in in what we do in our company sure uh, so we have one more question uh, how can we decide the risk code so um, you know we offered a couple ideas on the methods from what uh, Jeff talked about uh, again you know the most simple is just to have different levels uh, based on characteristics so for example if there's a metasploit module that's going to be more important than if there's only an exploit db entry um, you could go with the weighting approach but there's i think there's some drawbacks to that as well um, our preferred method of course is to use machine learning because if you're training a model based on uh, what's actually been exploited you can have a good understanding of how accurate that model is and how many false positives and false negatives you have, and you have a, a very good understanding. Um, the scientific research has been pretty clear that machine learning models are the best way to create a predictive score, um, and that would be that would be the ideal. But short of that, you know, I think using some kind of weighting or leveling approach, um, you know, will at least be better than CVSS. Sure, I think as we are. A on top of the hour, I will just take two last questions. So other question we have is, uh, do hackers discuss vulnerabilities before a Metasploit module becomes available? Oh, all the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, the last question would be, what is the hardest part about setting up machine learning to predict about which vulnerabilities will be exploited? Um, I think there's a lot of challenges. I think probably the primary challenge is getting the right data in place. Um, that's number one. And then I think the next challenge is uh, maintaining that model. Uh, you have to you have to under you have to be doing the experiments on your approach to make sure it's accurate. And it takes a little while to make sure you're getting the right uh, the level of accuracy where it's um, providing value. And in order to do that, you probably would have to hire someone who is knowledgeable in machine learning or contract out. Um, but it's not just a one-time thing. You've got to retrain that model on a regular basis to maintain your accuracy. And I think you know the reason you need to do that is the threat intel changes, the threat landscape changes, the types of things people are interested in exploiting changes. Um, and you know, and that's you know, those are some of the key uh, issues with the machine learning approach. Okay, great. So that brings us to the end of the questions. So thank you, Paulo, James, and Jeff for a great session. Uh, also, big thanks to all chapter members for joining this webinar. Uh, all other participants who want to join ICSUR Bangalore chapter can reach out to our membership director, Shilpa Oswal, at membership at the rate icsquare-bangalore-chapter.org. And one last note to all the webinar participants, you will be redirect to, redirected to the Cytocon webpage at the end of this webinar, uh, which looks like what is on the screen right now. Uh, and yeah, I look forward to welcoming you again in two weeks with another webinar. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone.